We're super excited to announce that we're now Instant Brand Ambassadors. We've been working with them for a couple of years now and love their gear. Uh, recently, we were at a festival in England called Car Fest, and we did a cooking demo to a few hundred people um, showing how incredible an air fryer is, especially our favorite one is the Vortex Versa Zone. It's got two separate areas. In one, it's like an eight liter drawer in it and both of them you can start at different times and they'll finish at the same time. We did cinnamon swirls and a chocolate chili burrito bowl. So really cool and literally, you know, their tagline is goodbye oven, hello instant. And David Flynn uh, has recently, you know, he bought a house a couple of years, maybe a year ago and the oven is only used by his children to make cookies. Dave only uses his air air fryer. So really efficient, the instant Vortex Verzone Plus. There's 25% off it. If you would like to support this podcast, a really great way to do it is to actually, you know, we only align with brands that we really believe in. And there's a link in the show notes that'll get you 25% off. And we really believe in these. They're a great way of getting that crispy texture with using a fraction of the oil. So just to let you know, we're Instagram ambassadors. Really cool. Check out the Vortex Verzone Plus. Uh, we've always been telling our kids to drink more water, yet recently they came back and showed us how to drink more water. Ooh. Yeah, my daughter came back with an air up water bottle about six months ago, and I was like, oh, what's so fancy about this water bottle? And she showed me, like, it's literally got water in the bottle. It's got flavor, scent-based flavor pods in the top. You activate them, and it makes the water, like, it somehow uses scent-based technology that when you drink the water, plain water, it smells of one of the flavors. So in this case, I've got a pineapple pod. I activate it and I drink pure water. Well, I'll tell you how it works. Yeah. It uses scent-based technology so that the, the flavor comes into your mouth and goes up your retronasal your cavity. So isn't that really clever? So it goes in the back of your mouth and up to your nose where 70 to 90% of your taste or flavor um, is experienced. Yeah, so so what's amazing about it is they've innovated a water bottle to make it easier for you to drink more water that's fun and playful. There's 25 different flavours. My favourite is cherry cola with uh, fizzy water. It actually tastes like cherry cola. And I think the benefits are ultimately that you're reducing single-use pla- use plastic and also you don't have to add any sugars to get water that tastes incredible. Yeah, my mother-in-law loves the cherry one. I bought her a bottle too because she wasn't drinking enough water too and she does lots of lawn bowls. Um, so yeah she likes watermelon cherry so we've partnered with them you get a 10% discount with the code HAPPY10 or you've got an affiliate link in our show notes please click that if you want to purchase them um, and they're class I'd really really recommend them Anthony Malali what a pleasure genuinely and just for anyone who isn't watching this you're some specimen like yeah, you my really son, are, my son like Tor, is- Tor met he man <laughs> My son Theo has taken a real light and he's like, wow, I'd be like him. Like, as Anthony's like this specimen. Even this morning, specimen we went, sounds weird. So he's made, a, he's made six foot 15. Six foot 15. Like, <laughs> six foot 15 and built like a brick shit house. That'd be it. And like, <laughs> well, like, you know, we say that with absolute reverence. Even today, when we were going into the sea, Anthony had his hair down and he was like, just this big beast of a man. I was like, where's your sword? You know the way? Anyway. Sorry to object to no, you. thank you. I'm used to it. Used to it. <laughs> <laughs> that was that great. Was great. Well, yeah, thanks thank for coming out. No, yeah. it's really nice to be here. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we spoke about this for a while now, haven't we? So it's yeah, nice. really yeah. have, really have. And I guess you've been, you've definitely been someone who we've admired over the years, particularly in the area of, you know, people often will always go as a male that's been eating plant-based for more than 20 years. Uh, people that go, ah, oh, like, where do you get your protein from? Like, I'm just going to be some skinny hippie vegan dude. Yet you are the antis of this. You are this specimen, as we've objectified you already, that has been eating plant based and playing professional, professional rugby, rugby, or rugby league. Sorry, I mix yeah, them up. Rugby league. Yeah, don't don't mix it up, mate. You'll get, <laughs> uh, you get me in trouble. Um, yeah, obviously that was part of. I think it was about 25 when I stopped when I stopped eating meat, and yeah, there's all that stigma around that. Um, our kind of like manly, manliness is is um, comes hand in hand with, with with what we eat, I suppose. But I've I've always kind of thought I never really agreed with that because I don't think there's anything manly about kind of going to Sainsbury's and buying buying a steak. And you know? if uh, I I honestly I have no I have no problem with like people with a uh, small holdings might be like maybe like kill a cow for the winter and like uh, feed the whole family from it and stuff like that. If you're doing it yourself, like like a, f- a fair play to you. But there's nothing manly about kind of 
going to Sainsbury's and buying um, something that you've not actually done yourself, you know. So then to think you're manly for doing that, I'm like, well, is that really um, is that really the measure of a, of manliness? Absolutely. Yeah. And then how was it like? How did you decide to come? Yeah, where, where, where especially was... especially someone who grew up playing rugby in that kind of macho environment from Northern England as well, which isn't exactly like you know a woo woo kind of place where you know vegan would be common. You know, Northern England would be yeah. more. You know, I think of. It's more tough. Like it's it's many different things. It's not just yeah, one thing. Yeah, like little industrial town in, in the north of England called uh, Widnes. Yeah, it's not really um, Widnes with a D. Widnes. Yeah. Wid. Sorry, I just say I say things weird. So if anyone, no, it's lovely. Might need to put uh, subtitles. So I say <laughs> I say Burr. So B E A R. Burr. Burr. Like grizzly Burr, but I say Burr. So oh, many cool. people they say what? I'm like Burr. I can't say it the other way. So Burr were her. The I say it all really weird when I'm doing like my presentations. I'm like right. If you need me to translate at any point, just uh, <laughs> just, just give it just, just tell me. Um, yeah, me my sister and her partner stopped eating meat, and at first I was kind of giving them crap, like as I got it, which right, fair enough. Um, and then I started to watch some certain things. Um, but like the sustainability sustainability side of things, the ethical side of things, and and uh, and health and like kind of all these different things just made me start to be a bit more curious, and so I started to look into it more. Um, and, and did you feel even while still playing professional rugby and being around all the lads, did it feel like almost like you're cheating on them or kind of going down a different road? Because even to pursue that while playing rugby and being in these you know, very macho environments because we played rugby for mm. 10, 15 years and it's this very lad, lad, lad. Did it feel kind of strange to be, you know, curious about vegetables and lentils? <laughs> yeah, lads, I'm cheating on you. I'm eating me, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it did. And look, like, that kind of start, I was like the kind of an antithesis of like me, my, I'm not, I've never been, but well, maybe in my early days, my early twenties, I was like a stereotypical like rugby player. But then I started to change, and I, I start obviously stopped eating meat, etc. Um, and then I obviously got into like meditation, breath work, those kind of like more like introspective practices for out of necessity. Um, obviously, the way I, the way I was kind of behaving wasn't wasn't just didn't feel authentic anymore. So it, it took me on a different path. Um, so I was like the the veggie, like uh, like the I was like rugby league's hippie kind of thing. And so it was the kind of the start of my journey of just kind of like being the opposite uh, stereotype of of a, of a professional athlete. Um, obviously, then we go into we just mentioned like when I was living in the van just after COVID, etc. So um, I've always kind of gone against the grain from a certain age with the rugby, and I've always kind of had had to deal with that from the guys. But it's not it's all lighthearted. Obviously, you, you get a lot of crap, but it's like any kind of pack mentality in a, in a team. They always, they always look for like the kind of guy you would remember when you were playing who um who bites so like there's like there's like like a pack of wolves and they're kind of like going around and if they, they give someone they give someone a bit of crap and then if the person just brushes it off doesn't curse like, oh, I'm not getting not getting the response I wanted so they move on to that person's like oh and like got you and then they'll kind of stay on it they'll stay on that person it's a bit harsh um but that's just that's just the mentality as you remember um so that was it with me with the veggie stuff and the, the meditation etc. But then I just didn't care. I didn't really, I didn't, I did respond that first. Like all, all, all like people who, who go on that journey, they start to, to try, you do, we do kind of, you do preach a little. I, I preach a little bit. I won't, I won't lie at the start, but then I realized that's not the way to go about it. Um, I need to meet people where they're at. And if you want to have a conversation about these things, will, preaching but, is in, in te- encouraging them to eat more veg. Yeah, maybe consider it, it, going exactly, more plant-based. Exactly. Cause you're so passionate about it, aren't you? You want to kind of like, you want to tell others, but like, people don't really enjoy being told what to do. So, And how did it originally like affect your performance? Like, as I'm sure as a professional athlete and a big hunk of a man that, you know, at the time you were saying you were 115 kilos and when you suddenly change to be more plant-based as a professional athlete, that's probably frightening for the nutritionist on the team or the coach. Or the or, coach. Going, and hey, you were you saying doing? your coach was quite a, a staunch kind of ex-military Marine that was quite, yeah. you know, very macho. So h- how did that play out? Um, well, I probably, I probably won't say on here what yeah. he, what he said what he said to me as a joke is not quite appropriate. But his his response would have been as as expected. But in terms of a performance, it didn't it didn't alter one bit, and that's kind of what I want. So I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not here to make any claims that it's going to improve performance. But if you can if you can kind of make that cho- moral choice to move to a lifestyle that's kind of more in line with your ethics and um, what feels more authentic whilst doing some advice playing like elite sport if you can do that 
and not have your performance compromised. That's what it was about for me. So if I can still do it, uh, still compete and and make this lifestyle ch choice, then great. So yeah, I'd never seen any uh, declines in strength, performance, or anything like that. It, uh, I felt I felt as good as ever. So it was a it was a win win. Really. And you did acknowledge that you kind of almost grew more muscle or you said that it was kind of almost like some of the lost fat and, lost gained. Fat and gained muscle. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned the nutritionist and he kept a close eye on me. I was having me calipers done regularly and me weight. So at one point me... Calipers is a way of measuring yeah, your kind of body the, fat the composition. The of like, and they'll, they'll find the sights and like pinch you around your waist and your biceps. And um, it's, it's, it's not obviously... Um, it's, there's, there's probably best like DEXA scan and stuff, better ways to do it, but it's a good way to do it manually. Um, and yeah, one, at one point I actually, uh, my weight stayed the same. I might put on a little bit of weight, but my calipers went down. So in, insinuating that obviously I'd have lost a bit of fat and maintained the muscle. So, which is obviously a lot of, a lot of talk on like a plant-based diet is that you can't really do that. You can't like maintain like lean, lean mass. So that was just nice to kind of, oh, actually you can do that. So yeah, that was, um, that was a, that was a positive for sure. And wow. it made, made the nutritionist happy. And did it, one of the things that people will often say about when you shift to a plant-based diet is that you've got more, you know, you've taken out a lot of the fat, you've taken it out of the processed foods. Generally, if you're focusing on a whole food plant-based diet um, and the holy grail of elite athlete is being able to recover quicker so that you can perform better, you know, so you can, a bit like mm. you strain a muscle and if you can strain it more often, it's going to grow better and stronger. And I guess it's that kind of idea that the holy grail of elite athlete is being able to recover quicker so you can train quicker. And, you know, in the likes of game changes and things like that, they'll certainly imply that you'll recover quicker. Did you find that in terms of recovering from games and like, because rugby now is like, and rugby league, rugby union, both of them, like they're so physically demanding and there's so much knocks and hits in the body. Did you find your recovery changed in any way? Yeah, so there was there was a few there was a few things, and, and that definitely is. The, I just I remember kind of distinctly not feeling as as sore. Um, uh, at some points, I was like, I'm sure, like I used to feel a bit sore than this. So it, I think I I personally feel like it definitely helped with with, uh, with me with me recovery, and I felt a bit more like alert and stuff in the morning. So I remember that. I remember. Don't get me wrong, I have a coffee now, but I wait till like a certain time, etc. And a lot of the boys were coming in like like just like loading up on coffee before we started and I, I always felt okay and yeah my recovery my recovery felt good so um, that, that was definitely a benefit for sure wow it really is like trailblazer in a sense like you know in this complete macho culture to go the app like it's very brave well you know Thank and you. then hat off to you genuinely. yeah absolutely and then in that circle like what was masculinity when you were playing professional rugby and you were hanging around with largely? And one other bit that I thought was interesting, a friend was over with his friend who was a professional football player and the lads were kind of mid-twenties and he found that because they just played professional sports and then when they weren't, when they were outside of training, a lot of their other friends weren't there. So they hung out together and they played kind of games and they didn't like computer games and they didn't necessarily have as great a breath of kind of non-sporting activities hobbies, yeah. or hobbies, if you will. They weren't kind of like learning a new language typically. And I just wonder how was masculinity for you in that context, you know, playing professional rugby and what was it? Was it typically the macho one or did they show vulnerability or weakness or was it just all the pack, the pack? Mm, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of both. But I think, I think back then I didn't really understand what, what it meant, what like masculinity meant. We hear it and, um, we have, we have kind of these like, um, perceptions of, of what it means, but there's, there's different, there's different connotations, isn't there? There's like the physical traits of the masculine, which, which if you Googled it, it'd be like, like a strong looking man or, some, or, some, or something like that, or like, um, hurry, you know, the, the, these are kind of like, um, just distinctions that we, um, that we, that we put with masculinity, but then there's kind of, um, obviously the, the archetypes of masculinity and the, like the morals, the moral side of it, like the, the, uh, internal kind of, um, value values that like one should necessarily strive to kind of um strive to kind of Im implement um but going back to going back to your question yeah it was it was very much it was more more when, you, when you're younger and more when we were younger and you, you were coming we were coming through there's kind of very much like a cult for, for me especially um i i i was always of, of the opinion that masculinity meant that you're almost you know like like you're like dominant in, in in a sense so like we always kind of 
in in that pack you're always kind of toppling each other like who can who's like who can drink the most um who can who can lift who can lift them off which is which is still fun to do who's now the, 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 lift, the, food the chain. That. yeah exactly and who and um who's that, the alpha yeah yeah and that kind of that kind of um initial you can call that kind of like a pseudo initiation that that was my initiation into into manhood i suppose and so it's like a pseudo initiation and pseudo initiation is kind of where it doesn't breed necessarily the best kind of um type of masculinity because it's all kind of like hyper dominant hyper dominance based and um where if, if you kind of look at like uh, in, indigenous cultures and uh, our our own the celtic and there would have been like elders in in the village and like the younger men going from like 17 to 18 or whatever age they would have might have been younger back then um they would have went on some sort of vision quest um, they would have had like these principles that are installed upon them as like okay this is what it means to be to be masculine this is what it means to be a man these are the kind of like there was a discussion could, could, there was could, you, a, yeah. could you describe like a vision quest you know i've certainly heard a little bit about it could you mm. describe for anyone who's listening what is a vision quest and what was it typically like when was it done Yes, yeah. or is it still done? I think it's still, it's still done. Yeah, still a do friend it. did one recently. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it depends on the culture, doesn't it? It depends on the tra- on, on the tradition, but it normally it's something that involves around four day, three to four days of fasting. You're out in the wilderness, so it's it's they say you go, you kind of going. Obviously, the Sp- I think the Spartans did something even more more gnarly. Um, but essentially, you kind of go in, you're going back to nature to look to look for the answers. So you're kind of looking for the messages, like in in the land and like. Uh, the natural environment and obviously when you when there's nothing else there no other stimuluses you kind of have to go in, inward and um yeah kind of unraveling trying to the some of the conditioning that's been put upon us um so yeah fat and i think some might use like uh, plant medicines as well I'm, I'm i'm not quite sure but fasting being out in the wilderness um kind of like you got like, your lodges your sweat lodges and that kind of stuff that different traditions would have used where they're, where they're really taking you out of yourself. It's like those traditional sure. rites of passage, which are often mm. missing in modern day culture. Yeah. Even I was reading a cool book um, about a culture in kind of just north of the Ivory Coast. And they used to, when boys were 13, they'd all have to go on this journey with the elders and way out there stuff. But it was like six weeks where they were all there and taught. And many of them, a number of them would die every year. But it was this rite of passage with when you went through, you came back and you were treated as an adult. Mm. And I think this is, that's what Vision yeah. Quest would have Well, well I th- think even in that, because I read that same book, that you didn't go back to your own family because they saw you, they would have saw you as a little boy. You went somewhere else because you were going to be treated as a man, you uh-huh. know, because wow. there would have been too much historical legacy, you know, relationship yeah, legacy yeah. that, oh, you're only 13, you're only a little boy, you're mm. not a man. Whereas it was like, okay, you got to be treated differently to, yeah. you know, change the environment if you want to change the, yeah. how someone interacts. Yeah, totally. I think that's what's missed, definitely missing in our culture, like here in the West. And like now it's just a tick of a clock that like, okay, now you're a man and now you have these like responsibilities and a lot of us aren't really aren't really. But there's no training or role yeah, model yeah, or that. Exactly. And, and then like, within rugby, was there like, would the coach have served that role model or was it the sometimes. peers? Or it was just dominance. That was the main masculinity kind of expression. No, I lo- not always. Like I, I, don't, I love rugby and like rugby's like give me a, a lot of the stuff I have in my life and I've learned so many lessons from it. But just there, there is parts of the of, of the culture that um, can be, um, yeah, it can, just just not not great sometimes. But in a whole, it's good. But it is very, it is very much kind of like based on um, a, a lot of the physical, and that is our job. So of, of course, but um, I think more kind of emphasis on like kind of um, st- I think with the way we talk about strength. Um, is really important as well like because there's more i think there needs to be more distinctions around strength and kind of obviously strength super important as a physical quality but it's also equally as important as a as a psychological quality like how much can kind of we kind of withstand psychologically how much can we persevere without kind of like breaking like morally and um yeah and just kind of like how strength is it's more of like the one's effort so it's strong just to kind of take on something that we might think's like bigger than our, our capacity it takes strength to kind of take on these things like morally and um yeah i just think we need i just think we need different and again when i say with me and i with the kind of retreats the mental retreats that are in now i'm just creating a conversation for a kind of broader a, bro- a broader conversation of like how can we kind of as like as people who identify as masculine as, as men how can we um create these um, yeah, these Space values to discuss it yeah, almost, and like, but almost like a universal value system for for the younger generation to 
look up to and like, okay, what does it mean to be integral? What does it mean to have like purpose and direction? But also being able to like em em embody the feminine part of us as well, you know? So like be like a, an in well in a fully integrated man, you know? Like, and again, I haven't got the answers, but I'm, again, I'm trying to create uh, conversations and a lot of other men are doing this kind of thing as it's well. Am so. It's amazing because realistically now, like statistically, um, the biggest cause of death in the UK for men over the age of 50 is male suicide. So, and there's 8,000 men a year in the UK commit suicide. Maybe it's over, suicide. it's over 50 or, yeah, die by suicide, whether it's, uh, it's over 50 or over 55. So like it, there really is like the current paradigm of masculine is not working for a lot of people in that there's, mm. there's so much expectation. There's, you know, there's, there's Stiff cu upper lip, cultural programming, it. you know, you know, get on with it. You're a man, be a man. Yeah. Don't be such a pussy cat, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. There's so much you know, cultural stigma about being a man. And I think I really admire the way that you, as a, a very recently retired professional rugby player, that is a unit, as we've said many times, and is now really, you're venturing into like, you know, masculinity and really exploring it and building, creating spaces for people to have these conversations about what does it be to be, what it, what is it to be a man today? Like, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? And how collectively can we be better men? You are cordially invited to our first ever live podcast. We're doing it at our local theatre known as the Whale Theatre on Sunday the 8th. What's it on? Of October. Oops. So it's titled Screendemic. It's about Greystones is one of the first towns in the world ever to really encourage kids to ban mobile phones in primary Smart schools. Phones. It's called It Takes a Village. That's the nature of the programme. All the eight primary schools are involved in it. And we're talking to one of the principals of St. Patrick's Primary School. Her name is Rachel Harper. We're talking to Josh Barrington, who's a chaplain in Temple Carrick Secondary School, who's done research in terms of phones and mental health and we're talking with a dear friend Andrea Splendori. So the topic is about phones and teenagers and how it affects mental health and what is the implications of doing so. So it's a really important topic it's something that we're feel really um, curious quite passionate about and it's our first live podcast is on Sunday the 8th of October in the Whale Theatre. In Greystones it's 4pm and you can find tickets down below. Yeah so. there is a limited number of tickets so do get there first if you would like to come along. Yeah. Thanks Please Amel. Do. Cheers. Thanks Amel. Bye bye. Can we quickly just toxic masculinity? So uh, yeah. just uh, I'm going to just say my understanding. Can we just talk briefly around that? Toxic masculinity, as far as I'm aware, it means if anyone hears a little noise, Daisy's down here at the dog and she's chasing a fly. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, but in essence, toxic masculinity is when it's that stiff upper lip kind of the generation that came probably post the Victorian era where it was like a man was stiff upper lip, never expressed vulnerability, weakness, yeah. emotions. I don't have emotions. Yeah. Uh, it was, as you said, this kind of culture of this kind of programming of dominance, this type mm. of was the general, you know, expression of masculinity. What does toxic masculinity mean to you? And how can we as a society address it and start yeah. to bring the more, move more into the gentleman idea? Yeah, so... I, I honestly it's annoying because I don't I don't really like the phrase toxic masculinity no. but I get I know that's not because it almost saying. frightens people to be a man they're well, like am I allowed to be a man what is it to be a man so with the, by saying toxic masculinity I feel like it kind of blankets the whole um masculinity as a whole. I know we're not it's not meaning to but I think it does so then when when people are associated with being masculine so there's a negative connotation around it where masculine in its essence is, is very good is a very good um, like mature masculinity is very important is a very important thing but yeah toxic masculinity it's like kind of like obviously you just look at like Andrew Tate someone like that that's the kind of like the the epitome of it he's kind of he's like kind of preying on on like younger men who are a bit lost in the world and kind of like feel a bit threatened and he's like he's trying to kind of giving them a platform to think that they can act they act uh, he's kind of confusing like ar conf they were confusing arrogance for integrity almost you know so mm. um, yeah I the toxic masculinity is that it's like do, dominant, dominance driven, but it's mainly by fear, not being able to um, regulate your emotions. So for me, like I ask myself, like what I'm, I'm working on trying to be you know, like an emotionally mature man. I'm, I'm probably not there yet, but I'm working on it. And what does that, what does that look like being an emotionally man? I think this ties into toxic, mas toxic masculinity. I think it's the, the ability to express our, ourselves. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of, if you say, oh, men and emotions, it's almost a bit icky and people don't like talking about it. It sounds a bit of a, 
a cliche, but there's there's in the process in the body in interoception. Are, you, are we familiar? Yeah, no, great. It's it's, it's 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 we call it like the eighth sense, and it, a bit, all it is the eighth the sense. Eighth sense. Cool. Yeah, I thought you said ape. I was like, wow, the cool. Ape sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all it is essentially is the ability to be aware of bodily sensations. It sounds super simple, but there's a fancy name for it. And so the, what we kind of the the latest research on, on emotion that I've that I've seen is that. Whatever happens in, in the environment, um, it's not really about that. It's about what sensation that it makes occur in the body. And then from from the sensation, then the brain then interprets an emo will to interpret an emotion from that. Um so what I, what why I'm why I'm saying that is I feel like so let's say you mentioned vulnerability, and I think there's a big stat that's it that shows one of the biggest drivers of shame in men is feeling weak. Wow, uh, shame. Feel, okay. Yeah, shame, that, that, that yeah. makes us feel shame. It might not be just physical weakness. It might be like, um, like, like mental, like breaking down or crying, yeah, yeah. Or showing, showing that softer side. Exactly. That, so that vulnerability, that defeat, that defeat, almost. Exactly. So with that, I feel. So when we feel that weakness, when we feel, when we feel that vulnerability, we'll push it down. We'll push it down. We won't want to. We won't want to. Yeah, exactly. We won't want to feel it. And then look at anger. I think anger in itself, in its essence, is is isn't a bad thing. It's it's like a call to action. We can use anger. We can kind of like alchemize it. But instead, because we've been society, on a societal standpoint, we've been told like anger is a bad thing, especially for like men. Don't be an angry man. It's like dangerous. Um, we've pushed it down, and obviously, if you push a beach ball in the water, it's going to come back. So we deny this expression, a healthy expression of anger, uh, which might even look like just going for a, going for a run. If, if like we're feeling it, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna go for a run. Instead, we kind of push it down, and then it's gonna manifest disproportionately. <laughs> exactly. You know, your missus asked you to want to brew. I don't want to brew. You know. You know. What I mean, like that. That's a silly example, but that's kind of why a lot of men react in certain ways I'm, mis I'm i'm not perfect you know and I, I just definitely don't do as much as i used to so toxic masculinity for me is is not being able to f properly communicate these um interpret these sensations properly and um, so and, and it's almost like learning to to understand the different sensations in your body and categorize them right now i'm feeling jealous right now i'm feeling slightly nervous right now i'm feeling excited it's awareness and understanding how to label them and many like me growing up I wasn't taught this I was taught algebra and glaciated valleys and oxbow lakes and really important things you know I'm, I'm not undermining them but I was never really taught like okay what's that emotion can you describe that emotion it was like just get on with it you where do you do this yeah. from or how whereas, do you deal with it whereas what's... I look at my son now who's 10 he's way more emotionally aware than me he'll say dad I'm feeling a bit jealous but also a bit frustrated I'm like mm. why what does wow. that feel like two at the same time yeah. oh my <laughs> wow. god that's, you're like a superhero that's great awareness <laughs> yeah, yeah can I you said one word there and, shame. And the, shame I'd love to talk about shame shame and masculinity because shame definitely like in that stat which I said about the you know that uh, death by suicide in men mm. over 50 or 55 is one of the biggest cause of death in the UK and I'm sure it's all all across Western culture like and I think shame is definitely one of the one of, one of a uh, key contributing factor because it's it really is one of the toughest feelings to experience that sense of shame yeah it sucks yeah and what what leads to like what is like how is how does it kind of shame where, shame as far as I'm aware it involves the other doesn't it it's where you're almost you're seeing less less than the other Mm. No, I don't know if that was a good example. Mm, okay, I was trying. No, yeah. no, I think we were just spitballing, aren't we? Like, yeah, so but that's. I, well, so I think, sh I think if, if you when you say shame for me, what comes with that is like in inadequacy. Oh yeah. So like we feel in inadequate, and it depends obviously on one situations. Maybe we feel inadequate that we can't we can't support our our family. So obviously, as as a masculine man in in there in the house or there's still like an obligation isn't it? even though that's not might not be the case anymore and it's sh like showing that and like there's there's like a there's a balance now but i still f i feel like this can be leading some men to feel oh and it's worse if, if i'm not giving if like my partner's making just as much money as me uh or maybe more um it's like, oh that, that might make me feel shame like oh should i and that's like all that when you say like toxic masculinity that's kind of all paradigm isn't it kind of like um, the man's the breadwinner, the woman's the stays at stays home at keeper. home, homekeeper, etc. And um, so, it, obviously, with the with the re reverse roles now, I think that's definitely a big driver in, in shame for men. So, like inadequacy, um, for sure, that's what comes up for me.
there was there was a friend who worked with us. Uh, he worked with us. He worked with us maybe it was five or ten years ago. But uh, and his dad was one of the. He was a big doctor. He was you know in the state. He was very involved in the state. So he was he climbed up the the food chain quite high. And he was a well established doctor. And uh, our friend was he was our age. So he was at the time he must have been in his thirties. And his dad was his dad was like eighty. And I remember he his dad was kind of he was chatting with his dad one day and he said like what's the thing that's changed most in your lifetime. And he said, the role of the man has changed so much. He said, like, in my lifetime, it's gone from where the man worked and came home and sat and had his pipe and had a cup of tea and did very little at home to where I look at us now today, like so involved with family life and doing all but breastfeeding in terms of raising family and absolutely love it and wouldn't want it any other way. But I think over the last 50 years or 100, you know, I look at my parent, my dad and my granddad and how the role has kind of changed over the last number of generations like man it's changed a huge amount and even nowadays like it's gone even more in terms of gender fluidity and sexual preferences and all this type of stuff that really even in our generation it, we didn't have to deal with this as much as younger generations now who are like you know 15 year olds and 20 year olds and you know it, there, there's so much that like and that's why I really admire your your kind of you're 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 realizing that we need more role models that are leading people in terms of masculinity and what what it can be and how it can be a light to the world rather than be you know cause more darkness and shame possibly exactly yeah like distinct distinctions and like you don't you don't i don't want to go too far the other way because it is really important so i i think the um, a lot of the kind of um some of the like old kind of rules around like the, the masculine is really important like uh, I'm like um, I feel like being able to set your bound, you set, set boundaries and be firm, and like obviously take care of your family is su is super important. But we need we need to be able to integrate the uh, the the other the other side the other side of it as well. Um, but yeah, I think things things are changing, aren't they? Like society's changing, so I think as like as men, we need to navigate how we how how that that change is happening, and how then, but we still kind of embody the core kind of values and of integral masculinity like uh, what's it what's it what's it look like to be an integral man what's it look like to be purposeful like show the show direction but also uh, like an, almost like a shepherd i feel like masculinity is like the role of the shepherd to kind of uh um like take her and like but and this can be in, in the woman as well you know but just like to to be that, that strong kind of presence um i think that, i think that's really important but we're also being able to integrate the, the the softer side of ourselves as well we don't want to dis imbalance in in the energies you know yeah, yeah, because that's the archetype of the gentleman, at least the one that I have in my head, you know, where they can be strong and firm and have clear boundaries yeah. and they have drive and they have clarity of character, you know, and determination. Like I, I love those like back po Victorian or pre Victorian era where there was like they celebrated character, they didn't celebrate celebrities, they, they admired someone's character. And I think that's beautiful where you go, that's an honest person. I yeah. like that. That's a person who does what they say. Good they do. character. I trust that person. Mm. I think that's a true ce celebrity as in someone we should celebrate. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I'd love to go back there if we could. But yeah. maybe, maybe it's <laughs> maybe, just the yeah, grass sure was greener issues. and yeah, it was just, you know, at the mm. time, like I'm sure there was other different times because the role of the man, the gentleman at that stage was definitely coming home and sitting smoking his pipe and can I have me dinner and, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, he probably wasn't doing the job. Okay, I've had enough of the, the children. Nappies. Can you please bring them to the other room? You yeah, know, oh this yeah, it was, it was all that kind of old school. Even I remember when we, when as kids, uh, we'd go every Sunday, go out to our granny and Jack. Jack granny and grandparents. Gran grandparents. And we'd all have lunch together and back then it was probably lamb and whatever it was back when we were eating meat but after maybe half an hour Jack would say that's enough of the kids will you put them in the other room and that was that that was our granddad and that was what happened like enough of the children you know and it was literally I've had enough like off you go can one of the ladies look after them it was just so <laughs> different um, different in terms of what's a men's circle like a men's circle and, and how, how do your retreats work how, like because I'm sure lots of people listening go okay, that sounds great like it sounds really good you know, how, how do they work? And, and what is it? Like, what is a men's retreat men's or men's circle. space or men's circle? Or? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, it's specifically men's retreat, and like, don't get me wrong, it's it's not been easy to to, to run men's retreats. Um, it's, I'm coming to me fourth year now, and how did you get in? How did you get into it? Is it that you went to one yourself and thought this is? How are we doing for time? How are we, yeah, we're doing, oh, great. We're doing great. Yeah, loads. How are we, how are we doing? All right. Uh, so we'll go. And we all love a good story. We'll go. So. My, my again my kind of so i didn't i didn't grow up with a with a positive um, male role model um, was your father there when you were growing no, up? He, no he wasn't there he left when i was around when i was around four 
And the recent, recent kind of conversations with my mother actually kind of, um, he's undiagnosed, but he was definitely a narcissist, like definitely like, un an inability to kind of like empathize and feel kind of certain things. So I like, was just all about himself. Yeah. All about, you know, all from what kind of un 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 uncovering he was, he was all about himself, probably borderline psychopathic, but I'm not a psychologist, so I can't make that call. Um, but anyway so that kind of left this void and again, not a void because my mum did an amazing job she's like a tough woman like tough irish woman she like beat up dudes um <laughs> so, so she um so she did a great she did the best job but she's not she's not a man you know so um there was that kind of there was that kind of a bit of a there wasn't someone there so when i started to like so my son's a teenager now he's 13 and like he's 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 a great kid he's getting a little bit of trouble in school um, he's a bo he's boxing now and stuff. But if he's if he's swaying a little bit, I'll 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 tell him, you know. I, but like in a nice way because swaying is in step out of yeah, line. Yeah, like just getting pushing a bit of the trouble, boundary, pushing the boundaries. I'll keep him in. I'll keep him in line. Um, then speaking to him, <laughs> yeah. convers conversations, open conversations, and like, is that is that behavior okay? You know, like, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about it. I didn't really obviously my mum. My mum, my mum was great with that, but kind of more, more when I was a teenager and I started going out drinking, I was kind of getting into trouble. I nearly, I nearly went to prison for fighting when I was 18. Um, and this was all, I was just pushing. I was trying to, I didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't know I was getting, I was getting hammered on the weekends. Um, and to be honest, that still happened until I was 24, to be honest. So it took a while for me to, to break that habit. Um, but yeah, just this trying to, trying to live up to this kind of um, character type that I thought it meant to be like a, um, to be a man, I, I wanted to be almost like, I wanted to be feared almost. I wanted to be this kind of like- um, Big, strong, yeah, drink yeah. loads of alcohol. Ex exactly. Eat more meat, just yeah. fight out, fight anyone. Yeah. Arm wrap, you know, like that kind of- Yeah, that-, that, that Masculinity that. measured in yeah. the ability to dominate almost. That was it. That was it. I never had someone to kind of put the hat, to put the like, down on my shoulder and say like, like, son, this isn't, this isn't what it means to be, to be, a, to be a man. You know, we, we can show strength in, in different ways. We can show integrity in different ways. It's more about- how can we, so it's, it's how it's so easy to be an asshole, isn't it? It's so easy to, to react poorly to anger, to respond poorly, but it's a lot harder to do the right thing in when, like when, when shit, uh, about to swear, yeah, 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 yeah. when, uh, when, when shit's hitting the fan for you to kind of be aware of this stuff that's coming up within you, acknowledge it, don't, don't um, deny it, but then integrate it, let it come in and out and then respond, respond with like measure. That's that, that's like true. That that's true. Like, um, I don't know. Right action. That's just right. That's 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 how I want to be. You know. That's kind of what I uh, strive to to, to, and to did be you, like. When you were kind of slightly, I guess, wandering off the path, and you know, you were drinking loads the weekend, getting in fights. You know, on and your that, way to prison, as you uh, said. Yeah, maybe. you were. You were. You. You know, you were going down a certain path, which you thought was the right one. Was there someone that showed up? Was there a mentor? Was there a role model? Or was there some kind of wake up moment where it was like, right, this isn't serving yeah. me. Like, what was the catalyst that yeah. kind of brought you in a totally different path? So again, my mum's always been a great, a great role model for me. Um, and she always will be. Um, but the, the, the point was, so I, I, this was a few years after like the kind of uh, uh, trouble with the police. Um, I was just, just kind of like perpetual going out drinking. You know, it's like that anxiety after after a big kind of a night out. I just I just really didn't enjoy it anymore. And there's one I just felt so like whole and so inauthentic. Um, and I, I needed a change, but I didn't know. I, was, I said, I don't feel authentic, but I didn't know what the authentic version of myself looked like. Even good that you could articulate it, like using the word authenticity. I couldn't then, though. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you probably just said, I feel crap. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know who I am or what yeah, my real. I exactly, feel lost. Yeah. Exactly. And um, it's going to sound like a cliche because I'm, I'm guessing you probably both read this book, but obviously The Power and Now, Eckhart, yeah, yeah. Eckhart Tolle. Amazing. Um, I, so someone, re so I, can't, I can't remember, someone, someone recommended, I think I've seen that book somewhere and then I started, I started reading that and just the whole concept of like you were never really we're never really here where you either kind of like we're worrying about what's going to happen or we can't let go of the past so we're living in two we're living in a parallel worlds apart from the one that's the right future here. And the past but yeah the present exactly but I know like we uh, people into this kind of world that's like bread and butter stuff isn't it but then I was like boom me like could have my head could have popped off and I was like what what oh, like what's it well stop the world and getting off and um so like, I read the book and got is to develop the meditation practice um so, so it was meditation was the kind of most catalyst massive yeah massively and it, that was you around 24. 25 i'd say and did you started playing professional rugby then or you oh were... I, I was right in the thick of my career i, I just um 
I, just before I won the grand final with, with Leeds, which really kind of... The Leeds Rhinos? Yeah, with, with the Go Leeds, Leeds Rhinos. <laughs> Um, wow, so you were kind of at the peak of your, like, yeah, you know, up there with your career. winning, winning tro silverware. Yeah. And then, so that led me on that road. And then after the grand final in 2017, that's something I always wanted to do. I remember this player coming, coming into our, our my college and he was like tapping his Super League ring on the table while he was like talking to us, it's like golden ring. I was like, I want that. Uh, Did you get one? Yeah, I, want, yeah, I got one. I got one. So, but I imagine that was my, like, all I ever wanted to You're do. You're not wearing it now though. No, I don't, I don't know where it is to be honest. My mum has it somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's not working. You are, more, you are more than that gold ring. <laughs> exactly. But that's what, I didn't realise that though at the time. And so then after the grand final, it's like this boom. And I was, a team like, like an Leeds. existential crisis, exactly. like that type of thing. Exactly, uh, and that well, that was kind of when I got into like when you achieve your out. dream, and suddenly you're like, yeah. oh, what do I do now? I still feel exactly, empty. exactly. So, um, so that kind of let that kind of I, I, I'd started to kind of understand the concept of like whatever. If we feel like we need something outside of ourselves to make us feel content and whole. Um, we're always going to be searching because obviously everything outside ourselves is subject to change as, as everything is. And so it's fleeting. So I was like, right, I need to, I need to find some long lasting contentment within to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to like navigate this life with, with uh, Jeez, some sort of amazing resolve. awareness to, you know, what a great realization. Well, that's the, what the grandfather did for me. So, and then it was like, I was at Leeds and Leeds were like, I used to say the Man United of football, but now it's more like the Man City of football or of rugby. So they were competing every year and, and the thought of trying to win. A they were, they were like right up there for sit. They were competing for silverware. Every yes. Year. So we won it the year before, but then to go to they obviously, but they don't have a rest then, you know, the next season's okay. We can rest on our laurels. Now it's like, okay. We win again and we go again. And for me, I was like, oh no, not again. Like I really feel like unmotivated. And uh, so my performance then started to dwindle as a consequence. So I started to... Because almost you started to be more curious. You, you'd achieved yeah. what all you wanted to achieve in yeah. rugby. And suddenly it was like, I really want to understand myself more. Yeah. And I want to understand the role of the man and masculinity mm. and meditation. Or, These softer things that probably rugby didn't necessarily provide the framework for you to explore. Or, or even there through the conversation, I'm realising that like maybe what we're searching for in masculinity and whether it's femininity or whatever it is, but that authentic version of yourself where you feel more content and complete yeah. in yourself. And aligned. Totally. I think that's what we're all kind of trying to do in this lifetime, isn't it? So, um, started to drop down the levels. I went to, I went to Toronto, I went to France. Was that hard for you? Like um, as a player and this is your career and you're actually kind of yeah. not performing at, as the level that you can. However, your real passion is suddenly yeah. being authentic Shifted. to yourself. It was frustrating because I had all the physical capabilities still. Um, yeah, I wasn't performing the same. It was a psychological uh, factor. Like your heart wasn't in it anymore. I struggled to get more. I used to kind of have to create these narratives before a game to get me up for it. To get me up for it, and I was like, right, I had to, I had to really kind of, right, remind myself, okay, you're this is bigger than you. You've got to do this for like a bigger, maybe use like plant the veganism. Like, I, I, you need to do this to still be an example, so you can show strength in, in other ways. But I, I really struggled, so I, I kept. I kept going down. So I went to Toronto, then went to France, all the while I was, I was doing all my training in it with like, with the breath work and stuff and, and the retreats. And, and then obviously COVID happened and I, and my team went bust, the Toronto Wolfpack, they went bust. And you remember, you know, Sonny Bill Williams? No, no. You know, you know, you know he's a- What sport is this? Rugby Union. He's, okay. like, he's like a legend in Rugby Union. So he came to Toronto. He's an all black. Yeah, he won. He won. A, he's won two World Cups. One rugby wow. league World Cup and, and rugby unions. Pro, pro boxer. Wow. Like, yeah. He's really and uh, a pro boxer as well. Yeah, he was. Oh my, like quite an archetype yeah. of masculinity. Yeah, wow. yeah, he was a good guy. But he came to our team, and I thought you might have known because that was like a big spectacle. It's like kind of like Ronaldo going to to a, to a team back then. At this the rugby version. But anyway, the, um, then we went bust. Obviously, overspent um, the owner and wh whatever that that happened. So everyone kind of sat tight until the season started again, they went on loan to other teams where I was like, oh, I think I'm just going to buy a van and go to Cornwall. And this was the opportunity for me. He was like, okay, this is, your, this is your chance to kind of get out. And what that time did, that kind of time without getting pissed, we didn't get paid either. I was making ends meet. And I was like, well, if it, uh, it kind of took away all the scarcity of like the, oh, the identity as a rugby player, but also you can actually survive without this kind of good income. Um, so I bought a van, I was in Cornwall and like the, I was doing a bit of landscape gardening, a bit of surf, wow. a bit of surf coaching. Like nice. on, 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 surf so, coaching, talk on it, about. And on, living in a van, I'm sure. Honestly, I'm sure it's pretty cool. Oh, you've seen, uh, what's the one with Russell Brand and 
they do let the pop up at the surface, they do less. You know what I mean? Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll go back to that. But I was like that anyway. I was, um, it was just, it was just a fun, it was just such, but that kind of liberation I felt from like this rugby career where everything was kind of like regimented and militant to kind of like living in a van and just doing what I needed to do to get by. It was so, it was so freeing and like so liberating. I felt great. I was, you probably I was, felt more authentic, did you? Yeah, a hundred percent. But I was like, well, but I knew it was, I knew it was okay for now. And I had, I had obviously bigger ambitions now with the stuff I'm doing now. Um, so then, then I was like, I'm going to have to go back to rugby and, and play, I suppose. I can't, because uh, I wasn't at the point where... How old, how, old, how old were you at that stage? Probably like 28, 29. And you've been plant based for a couple of years and you'd, yeah, yeah. you'd gone through Toronto and now yeah. you're in the van. I, I was 29, yeah. And then, um, I went, but I, so I, I ran, that's when I ran me, you asked how it started. I ran my first kind of like event, um, like workshop. Uh, I'd, uh, I did the breath work. We got a meditation teacher in. We did surfing and we had, we had some food, but. And I, men only. Men only. I thought, I'm just going to get get a group of men together. I didn't really know what I was doing. And you promoted it largely online. Promoted it a online. Good social follower. I was like, we're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to do some of these uh, cool, like, uh, cool activities, some introspective activities, and then we're going to have an open conversation. And I'd kind of, I'd kind of open the circle. I'd speak about kind of my experiences. And um, so going back to how it looks, um, the circle itself, it's interesting. And we, it changes now per retreat and we go off how the group feels, but sometimes there's a need to kind of be quite serious and kind of talk about serious things. But sometimes we just kind of talk about what's going, what's going on right now. You know, like, how are you right now? How's life, how's life for you right now? You know, like, on it, like how is it honestly, you know? And so, cause, um, we get a lot of guys say, I've said stuff here the first night and then I've like said to my wife, you know, cause we hold that kind of like fear of, of uh, feeling weak or them, fe them seeing us as weak. If we kind of show we're a bit vulnerable in certain ways. So it's a space that you can kind of drop. You leave, you kind of, we say you leave your baggage at the door. We can leave, you can leave your personality at the door if you want. We're just there. You're just in nature. And, um, we're there to kind of step away from the role we play, the provider, the, uh, the strong one, etc., and do some cool practice. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say there, it's amazing that like I can imagine, you know, when you create a safe space for men and so much of it had this cultural programming that I need to be successful, I need to have money and I need to collect shiny things and I need to have abs and all these things that you could get, uh, you know, men that are like, they look amazing from the outside as in they've got the car and the house and the money and the family, but they haven't really, they feel empty and when you get them there, there can be that break. You think they're, you know, at the start you meet them and, oh my God, you're a stockbroker and you do this and you do that. And then in day two, they might break down completely and go, oh, I like, I just don't feel, I feel like I'm living a lie. And, you know, like, I'm living I can a imagine someone else's dream. I can imagine it's such rewarding work because you're really holding a space for men, for men, and obviously this is in men's circles, to really explore what their authentic version, authentic version of themselves. You're right. And it's a, it's a free night, four day thing. And, the first night's always a bit icky. It's always a bit like cause some guys are, oh, the missus booked him to come. They didn't want yeah. to come. You know, they didn't want to be there. Wow. <laughs> like, like, so they're almost resentfully there. Yeah, yeah. And it, but they're still, the first nights are good. And, but then like the more the more different stuff we do. So it's a mixture of like, so we do jujitsu, surfing, um, like physical. Start with activities. Yeah, physical workouts. Burn, tire them out. Yeah, but then also like yin yoga, meditation, the restorative breath work, performance style uh, breathing. Um, and so it's like this, this, concoction of like physical activities, but then introspective activities. And it kind of builds up to a nice, um, to a nice thing in, in the evening where we feel a bit more connected. And obviously the last day we'll do like the conscious connected breath work, which is obviously the more kind of like altered state work. And that, traffic type yeah. Work. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's, and that's like, that's when it all comes together. You know, we've spent three days together to feel like safe around each other to do it. And yeah, some big, some big shifts happen, man. Right? I've seen some really great, transformations but it's again it's not me you know uh, it's, it's not just me. It's, it's providing it's the, the space whole, it's the whole thing it's every, every one every one of us doing that creating this uh creating this container so that, that's what i'm um, that's what i'm really passionate about and, um, and it's probably providing space for the awkwardness and sitting through the silence for yeah. someone to break it and that's yeah. part of it is just being able to lean into that discomfort of like yeah, wait, it. wait waiting for it's like dominoes waiting for one person to and to crack open in mm. a sense and be authentic and then it probably immediately someone else goes, geez, yeah, I think my, my relation with my dad was blah, 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 or, mm. you know, whatever it might be the, yeah. the thing that, and then a sure. domino effect, it happens. And then suddenly the layers start peeling away yeah. and there's smilier, shinier, lighter yeah. men. 
sitting in front of you. You both nailed it, and like the discomfort thing's huge as well. But it's still, we still can't put our finger on it. We still don't. There's a there's a process we go through, and at the start, it's always like that. But we know at the end, it's going to be great. Uh, they don't know it yet as well as some of them do and at uh, times it's probably like yeah. any journey you're lost and you're going shit this is the magic hasn't happened yet yeah. when's it coming yeah for sure but there's something about like the circle itself uh, obviously so the reason it's a circle is because there's no kind of there's no hierarchy there's no head of the table you know we're kind of we're in it together there's no kind of strain in your neck to to look at the person at the top so that's why it's a circle it's equal um but there's something about it and i still don't know after like year after four, four years, years of yeah. running um something about the circle that's like so empowering to see it when you when you see a when you see a kind of grown man um who might who may look like a typical man or may not in terms of like rugged or like muscular strong yeah like, but, but but when but even when the guys who necessarily a bit more a bit more feminine qualities when they see a guy who's a bit more rugged when they see him like speak like this it really gives them a like it really makes them feel good and like more because, accepted because uh, oh you you have a feminine side too yeah, i got one yeah, of them too exactly, that I hide. exactly we have so many guys who come and say oh i've never really felt comfortable around other men I've so, never cried. Uh, I've never felt yeah, comfortable yeah. crying. I've never cried. So to to have these kind of uh, experiences, is great. and being being obviously in the outdoors for four days, like barefoot, depending on where where we are, just like kind of like obviously nature, kind of like kind of rising, Except, and rises and it almost back. accepts you as you are. And do you mm. like fires for the certain? Course, you know that yeah. kind of yeah. elemental piece. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so like, if anyone is listening and goes, that sounds amazing. That sounds wonderful. That's perfect for me, for my brother, my husband, whatever it might be. How do you learn more about your men's retreats? So um, obviously this is called both sides retreats. So obviously both, both, both sides. Both sides. B-O-T-H. B-O-T-H like. sides uh, retreats.com. So obviously you go on the website and we've got the, we've got all the offerings for the next few moments into next year. Obviously on my Instagram, um, we've got the link on it. Anthony Malali, yeah. Or yeah, Malali's, Malali 91. 91. You can, you can find it through there. So yeah, we were mainly from like, Instagram online, um, like website, that's kind of where. And have you found that most of your following on social media is men or women? I'd say men. I'd yeah. say men. I wouldn't say it's like massively disproportionate, but it, I'd say it's probably men. And yeah. then for anyone listening who kind of goes, okay, like your what would be your learnings having run these men, men, you know, masculine retreats, but for anyone listening who kind of wants to find a more authentic version of themselves, what would be your your suggestion being that you've kind of from your helped experience. provide this space yeah. for men to find their more authentic, but it's the same. It's helping humans ultimately. Like what would be steps for any listener who kind of goes, yeah, it sounds lovely. I feel stuck. I feel lost. I feel confused. Like what would be your suggestions of where to yeah. start? I've, I've learned so much from these retreats, man. And like, like I keep saying, it's not me and it's not from like a imposter syndrome. Um, stand. It's just more like to emphasize that it's, it's, it's the group, it's the group. And like, I've, I've learned so much myself in being in these and stuff has come up for me in these retreats, like um, stuff from the past and that I've like, that, that I've been dealing with and that I'm still, that I've worked through. So it's been a massive journey for myself and it's probably why, subconsciously why I've been running them as well, you know, it's for myself as much as, as, much as everyone else. Um, but I think the first, the first place to start would be just to, um, to un understand that we're like, we're not in it, we're not in it alone. We're all going through that kind of same internal dialogue, the same internal sabotage. But, um, but again, that, that, when I say that internal sabotage, it's, it doesn't mean that internal voice. It's actually not a bad thing. It's, it's just trying to protect us really, isn't it? That kind of like egoic voice, but, but it, it protects us by a kind of like comparison and kind of like judgments to us. But if you really kind of sit with that and like, if you think what it's actually doing, it's actually just trying to protect you in a weird way, but it just goes that it, sometimes doesn't go out the best way of doing it. So I think you could more about just, you could have these kind of conversations. It's making the first step essentially is what I'm trying to say. Making the first step by speaking to someone, your best friend, um, your wife, because you might, there's something like you probably don't want to tell her because you fit not, not obviously something really bad, but something you just feel a bit shame or you feel like she might judge you. But but sometimes it can be easier to tell a stranger than it can be it your can. best friend, your wife, because it can. The, you, you you think they know you, you yeah. think they know all of you, but there's this secret shadow yeah. that you haven't talked about that sometimes it can For be sure. easier. And that's maybe why a man circle where you don't yeah. know people, it might be easier to express sides of yourself, which you haven't spoken to your loved ones. For sure. But you, you, you're exactly right. But, but that fear that you feel or apprehension to do that on the other side of that is a massive relief, is a massive like, 
oh, thank God, you know, like you've, you've got it off your chest, you've spoken, oh, they've actually really accepted me and they've appreciated you speaking honestly and, and, candid, and candid to me. So I think that's the first step. But obviously, if you, obviously then be, there's lots of local like men's circles probably in your area. So like trying to find out a space, um, a space where, where you can go for these kind of conversations. But I think we, I think we like to pride ourselves on not kind of being like too out there as well, even though it might sound it, but like compared to like some, like, on the kind of like, I feel there's almost kind of like this like spiritual ego that people develop when they go into this world. And it's like, they kind of start to dis, dis, disown the body, the, the, the earth. Like I'm not I'm too, I'm too like up there, I'm in the clouds where we need to come back down, you know, where we have to pay our taxes. You got to live in, you got to live in this world. So we like to, we, we call it the middle path. It's kind of like, it's being in the, it's being in the world, doing what we need to do, but knowing like we're, we're more, you know, we're, we're more than the sum of kind of our thoughts, past experiences, learned behaviors. So, um, yeah, we think we're very like um, appro approachable, um, and yeah, not too woo woo essentially. What I'm trying to say, but yeah, have that conversation with the person that that um, you think you think will probably judge you, but they probably because it's actually empowering to kind of to get it off your chest and yeah, just look look for kind of look for that community, look for the, look for the people who are doing the the stuff you want to be doing, take, taking that step. They're kind of my tips with that for that question. And then meditation, like meditation sounds like that's been a great catalyst to you on your yeah. own journey. Yeah. Could you talk about the importance of that? Because, you know, man, like, you know, we grew up in the rugby playing thing and meditation was definitely not part of it. And yeah. over the last kind of 10, 15 years, it's definitely become more main stage and very important for mental health and for peace and whatever. And in your own journey and on on the journey of hosting these men's circles, how important is the, the practice and whatever meditation might mean to someone, How because it doesn't necessarily mean to sit there cross-legged, you know, for half yeah. an hour at a time. Like, how important is meditation and creating this space for this? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Like, meditation looks very different for some people. You might like going for a walk in the forest by yourself in the morning. But meditation, it's it's like, I think uh, Alan Watts speaks about it's kind of like, in the, unless you're kind of creating that space, to be there now all you are is just a continuation of like okay what's next what's next and you're just kind of going you're never really you're never really here you're never really experiencing um what what's in front of you so it's it's essentially to, uh i think i think a lot of the there's a, bit, a few negative connotations around meditation that put people off that think i have to sit down i have to clear my mind i have to eradicate as you you both know that's not the that's not the point there's lots of different traditions and lots of different practices but it's the ability to to, to sit down and to create space from the from obviously the thoughts and the emotions that are passing through almost like like a like the blue sky and the clouds are passing by we're able to kind of just see it for what it is without direct directly identifying with it because the more we can kind of label and uh, when we're in an emotion the more we can kind of label it and differentiate from it the less power it has on us so we have to just sit there be impartial to what's coming and going and like have the breaks in between of, of stillness so the um being and being able to do that we're able to interpret like interpret our own like body sensations and emotions better because we just sit with it we're just aware of sensations and we can start to just pay attention okay what's this what's this sensation you know what's it look like how's it feel what color is it you know we can we can uh, create this kind of like um, better awareness and then we build we build a better relationship with our intuition as well because we get to we get to see okay what is actually my gut instinct what is my intuition and what's a passing thought because something one of them's fleeting and one of them's actually still there and kind of guides us so it's the it, get, it enables us to kind of have a healthy relationship with our thoughts and emotions, but also it builds us a deeper relationship with our intuition as well, our, our kind of inner knowing, like that gut feeling essentially. Mm. Um, so yeah, and that's what's the good thing about like breath work as well. You can just sit there and you can take five minutes and you do like a, you might want to breathe in for four, out for six, in for five, out for five, hold for five, just kind of reducing your breathing volume to like four breaths a minute, four to six. But with the thing is with that is you can just sit there and count and you don't have to worry about, okay, I'm going to sit and like... They kind of lead you to the same place. Exactly. Breath work and meditation, just one's more active and one's... Well, like exactly. meditate, sitting there is kind of tougher. Breath work in a sense is kind of easier, but they both lead you to spaces where you're more aware, more present and typically feel better. Exactly, exactly. It just, it's distracting them. With, when you're counting, you're distracting the mind, you're, you're creating an anchor of the mind. So obviously, um, 
And then obviously you will wonder, you wonder if thoughts will come in, you get lost, you worry about what you're having for breakfast or dinner, but you come back to the breath. And yeah. come back to you're, you're, you're a huge fan of breath work. Like this morning you were doing sprints, Steve, you and Raj were doing sprints, withholding your breath to yeah. build up your CO2 Diaphragm. tolerance and all sorts of things. And, and you were really having fun in terms of breath work, which was amazing. And I know you're just back from a jujitsu breath work for per performance. Yeah. Um, you know, coaching program or whatever. So it seems like, you know, breath work is a tool that you find very useful. Yeah, it's what it's what I do. It's like it's it's apart from the retreats, it's it's my uh, it's my job now. I've done various trainings, but um the most recent training I'm doing with a guy called Martin McPhilly is like the breath science um, um qualification and it really allowed me to go a bit deeper and like a, a deeper off into my clients. So now I like I work with kind of people on like dysfunctional breathing. And you were saying um, you work patterns. with an Olympian as well. Yeah I work, I work with like Olympic athletes and uh, when I work with athletes, it's more on like managing kind of like pre-competition anxiety and nerves and just optimizing their breathing so it doesn't diss it, so it doesn't become a burden to their performance. Um, and just being able to navigate arousal states because that's the biggest thing with the breathing. No, no one ever really told you to how to like manage kind of your like nerves when you were younger or if you're sad, or stop being sad if you're angry, stop being angry. But with like with the breathing, we can bring ourselves back into that part of the nervous system, which is more focused on like social engagement and communication. Um, cause when you're a bit agitated, when you're like in closer to your fight or flight, um, you were not in a place where we want to kind of be socially engaged. So having the awareness to kind of bring yourself back down. Um, so say you, so for example, say you've been, you've been out to the gym or something or a jujitsu class and you're still a bit, you're still a bit kind of a jacked. bit jacked and you want to, but you want to come in, you want to hug your kids and speak to your wife properly, etc. You're not going to be able to do that as well as you can if you're still in that highest sympathetic tone. So it's about the ability to, it's the ability to have the awareness of where your breathing is at, where your body's like, okay, I'm just going to do some slow restorative breathing. That's going to put me in that part of my nervous system, which is more inward focused. And then I can be a like express yourself in a, in a better play, way than fight and flight exactly exactly stay and play, stay, yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah. it it's your parasympathetic nervous parasympathetic, system right? yeah or oh, ventral ventral vagal yeah it's that part of a it's a it's a sub branch of the um vagus nerve yeah so yeah i help i help people with like dysfunctional breathing patterns or so something might have um something might have like caused anxiety this anxiety has caused a certain breathing pattern which is unconscious so it, but that's leading that's keeping them in a higher state of stress etc and then over long term that's detrimental so i like kind of work with them to kind of correct correct that um as well as the performance side of things so yeah that's kind of away from the retreats is is what i do as well amazing so, yeah. amazing so instagram is the main place uh malali 1991 no 91 91, but, uh, 90, uh, malali yeah. 91. <laughs> and you'll see this kind of hunky icon with kind of cool long hair <laughs> cool long hair and then your website again for for your treats is the other side um yeah so uh, both uh, obviously both. but both side retreats.com both side b-o-t-h-s-i-d.com yeah. and my website's like anthonymalali.com for like be one-to-one -one work and oh, for the like one-to-one -one, yeah, yeah. Uh, Anthony, this has been wonderful. It really, really has. Thanks so much for... And know. continue the great work. I think it's really important. Yeah, you're Thank doing you. God's work. You really, really are. I think if we can blow wind in your sails in any way, we're here of service. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I've had a blast so far. And uh, yeah, long way to continue. Woo! Thanks, Anthony. You're a star. <laughs> Cheers, guys.